Good Friday afternoon. My name is Greg Jones with Premier Building Products and thank you very much for tuning in this afternoon. We hope uh, you find the program informative. Before we get started, Premier Building Products out of Charlotte, North Carolina is a manufacturer's rep firm that handles Carlisle Syntex single ply systems, Hunter Panels insulation for both flat roofing and slope roofing, Metalera edge metals, fascia and coping, Georgia Pacific Dens deck, as well as the new product from Georgia Pacific called Dens Element, which is an exterior sheathing product that has a weather resistant barrier and air barrier included in it if you treat the joints with a product called Prosoco. We also handle slope proofing products from Ludovici Tile terracotta and underlayments from Carlisle. Today's presentation is single ply roofing technology and again I'm Greg Jones. This is program number C102. Attendees today will receive one learning unit for health, safety, and welfare. To receive your one AIE learning unit in health, safety, and welfare, email your name and company name and AIA number to ted at premierbldgproducts.com. And we will send that certificate right back to you. This presentation was put together by Carlisle Construction Materials. A little bit about Carlisle Construction Materials. Carlisle Construction Materials is a division of Carlisle Companies. Carlisle Companies headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina, traded on the New York Stock Exchange under ticker number CSL. Carlisle dates back to 1917. And in construction materials, Carlisle invented single ply roofing in the United States when they introduced EPDM rubber roofing back in the early 1960s. Today, Carlisle Construction Materials manufactures TPO roofing, EPDM roofing, polyvinyl chloride roofing, polyiso roof insulation, and expanded polystyrene, as well as coatings and waterproofing products. Today's presentation is an AIA accredited presentation. We will keep the program completely generic. At the conclusion of the generic AIA portion, I'll introduce you to some Carlisle products. But for the most part, during the presentation, we will keep it completely generic in accordance with AIA rules and regulations. All right, so today's learning objectives. We're going to talk about the design process from the very beginning as it relates to code compliance, both building code and energy code. And then we'll talk about the different single ply membrane materials and installation options. We'll look at energy efficiency and we'll talk about the energy code and compliance depending on where your project is located. And then we'll talk about cover boards and edge metals, some, some certain things that you can do to enhance the roof's durability. All right, so right off the bat, we're going to talk about the steps that you take to make the best choice based on the needs and budget of your client. Budget typically is a big consideration for all clients. And so we'll look at what is the proper amount of insulation. Is the client looking for a black roof or is the client looking for a white roof? We'll try to answer some of those questions. So the design process. There are certain chapters within the International Building Code that you will refer to for locating the information that you need to have for designing a low sloped roofing assembly. And sometimes these chapters will refer forward and backward uh, to certain sections within the code. And there are, variant, there are differences in the different versions of the International Building Code. For example, North Carolina's 2012 North Carolina Commercial Building Code actually follows the 2009 version of the International Building Code. If you're in South Carolina, 
you're following the 2012 version of the International Building Code. In both of these versions of the code, the first thing you need to do for design purposes and low slope roofing is you have to determine the uplift pressures that this roof will encounter. And so that is laid out for you in chapter 16 and specifically 1609.3, basic wind speed. We'll show you some maps that you'll encounter in chapter 16 and we'll tell you how you use those maps as we work towards determining the uplift pressures. So once we review the uplift pressures, in chapter 15, we'll look at a test, and they reference three tests in section 1504.3.1 that can be used for determining uplift pressures a roof will encounter in the field, perimeter, and corner. The most popular being ANSI FM 4474, and then we'll confirm the correct assembly based on those tested pressures and having a tested assembly that meets the uplift pressures that are encountered on this particular roof. After that, we'll take a look at warranty options, and warranties are an option in low slope roofing. There is no requirement in the code for any type of warranty in terms of length of service or wind speed. And oftentimes people get confused thinking that they need a particular wind speed warranty to meet code compliance, and that is simply not the case. There is no requirement at all for a length of service wind or wind speed warranty in low slope roofing. So there are five factors for determining these uplift pressures that we will have to determine for code compliance. And the five factors are the height of the building, the building location, and I'm going to show you these local wind speeds that are referenced in Chapter 16 of the code. We'll have to know the exposure category, B, C, or D, which I will show you. There are some slight variances in these exposure categories for the 2012 version of the IBC versus the 2009 version. We'll take into consideration whether there are large openings in a structure, for example, a large distribution center might have big door openings on, on the sides of the building. We'll want to take that into consideration. And then the importance factor, uh, the category of use one through four, which we'll define. So when you take a look in the 2009 version of the International Building Code, you'll come across this map and this is called the ASCII 7-05 three-second peak gust wind speed map. American Society of Civil Engineers is what ASCII stands for. And so in Charlotte, North Carolina, for example, we are in what is known as a 90 mile per hour wind zone. As you move towards the coast, you'll see that that three-second peak gust wind speed zone increases and you have some zones in the 130, 140, 50 range. So keep in mind that is one of, one, one of five factors that we will use for determining uplift pressures on a roofing assembly. Change here for ASCII from the 2009 version in 2012's IBC, there's a newer version of ASCE 7 and it's the ASCE 710 version. There's two distinct differences in these versions of ASCII 7. One is you'll see changes for the wind speed zones, and two, you'll have differences for the category of building. So that was a, that was a change that ASCII made in the 710 version. So for example, if we had a category two commercial building, and we are in Charlotte, North Carolina, where in ASCII 705, we were in a 90 mile per hour zone. If North Carolina was using ASCII or the 2012 version or ASCII 710, we would be in a 115 mile per hour zone. Slight change. The calculations for the uplift pressures are a little bit different. And the actual calcs aren't that much different, but the wind zone did change. If we take that category two building, 
and we have category three or four buildings, and this would be applicable in South Carolina, where they do use ASCII 710, you'd see if it was a category three or four building, that same wind zone would be a 120. So 115 for category two, 120 for a category three or four. And of course, all of the zones along the coast also increase. If you're confused by where the line is and what wind zone am I to use, here's a very helpful reference for you. It's called windspeed.atcouncil.org. And if you go to windspeed.atcouncil.org, as you can see here, you can plug in the longitude and latitude or the physical address of your project and click Get Wind Speed, and it will tell you not only what version of ASCII 7 that building is located in, but specifically what wind zone that building is located in. So it's a very nice reference. We talked a little bit about the building exposure, B, C, or D. There are some changes, particularly along the coast, between ASCII 705, which North Carolina uses, and ASCII 710, which South Carolina uses. So B is urban and suburban areas. That's the same in both versions. The big difference is with ASCII 705, shorelines and hurricane-prone areas are to use exposure C, rather than D, and then when you look at ASCII 710, if you're using ASCII 710 in South Carolina, if you're in a hurricane-prone area over near the coast, you would use exposure D. That is a fairly big change to make note of. The building use, you have four categories one being the lowest, two commercial buildings, three schools and public buildings, and four uh, essential facilities, hospitals, and or power plants. And there's also an, a nice document that you can download from the Single Ply Roofing Institute. It's called SPRY, spry.org. They have a document called ANSI SPRY WD1. And they have that version for both ASCII 705 and ASCII 710. In that document, you have tables that will give you the category of the building, the exposure, and the wind zone. And on the left, you can see the height of the building, and it'll give you the calculations for the uplift pressures. Now, this is not to take the place of engineers performing specific calculations for a building, but it is a nice quick reference guide that can be used. So, for example, this project in Charlotte, North Carolina, 60 feet high, these uplift pressures are shown in negative numbers because it's negative pressure that will try to suck the roof off of the structure. So if you had a negative 20.8 in the field, your perimeter and corner pre uplift pressures will always be greater. And so here in the perimeter, it's negative 34.9, and in the corner, negative 52.5. So if we have a tested assembly that meets a 60 PSF, it meets all those uplift pressures for the field perimeter and corner. The way we calculate that perimeter and corner is the outer boundary of the roof area uh, with, an equal, with a width equal to 40% of the building height or 10% of the building's least horizontal dimension, whichever is smaller, is how we calculate that perimeter area and then the intersection of which being the corner. Let's take a look at a project using the International Building Code 2012 version, which will take South Carolina, and we'll look at Charleston, South Carolina, commercial building, 60 feet. Uh, it's in exposure D, hurricane prone area. And so we have a field of 53.4, perimeter of 89.6, and a corner of 134.9. With that, we can use a 90 PSF tested assembly. 
will, it will handle the field, and in this case, the perimeter. But we will have to enhance the fastening at the corners using this tested assembly to make sure we're taking into consideration the negative 134.9 in the corner. So we would have an enhanced fastening pattern for the corner area. So in terms of writing specifications for performance requirements, as I mentioned, the code, the code specifically references three tests, the most popular being the ANSI FM 4474. That would be one to reference in a specification as well as reference to ASCII 7 and the requirements of the IBC and uh, ANSI SPRI WD1. The typical code compliance safety factor of those pressures is one. And so you don't have to enhance those pressures at all. You can if you want to, if you want to put one and a half times those pressures or two times those pressures, that's completely up to you. But the code requires it to be one. And that is in contrast to a factory mutual insured building. And a lot of people get confused about building code compliance versus factory mutual compliance. And if a structure is factory mutual insured, they will have their own specific criteria for not only uplift pressures, uh, they will have a safety factor of two for those uplift pressures, but they will also have some enhanced securement requirements above and beyond what the code requires. So for basic code compliance, we just want to have those uplift pressures calculated according to ASCII 7 and the version that that code in that state requires. Have that tested assembly and then make sure that tested assembly is greater to or equal to what we have calculated for per ASCII 7. We don't want to confuse code compliance with any type of warranty. As mentioned early on, the building codes do not require any wind speed warranty whatsoever. So, for example, if you're in a 90 mile per hour wind zone or a 140 mile per hour wind zone, there is no requirement for you to put into your specification a 140 mile per hour or 140 mile per hour wind speed warranty. All right, so what are the types of single ply roofing systems? So basically there are two types, what we will call thermosets and thermoplastics. And thermosets, you can heat, but you cannot fuse together. So they will require some type of adhesive, or in most instances, a tape adhesive to adjoin side laps and end laps. And then thermoplastics, you can actually heat weld to a monolithic a side lap and an end lap. The thermoset, most popular being EPDM. EPDM stands for ethylene polypropylene diene monomer. Most people would refer to it simply as rubber. And then you also have butyls and polyepichlorohydrin. Poly polyepichlorohydrin is a special form of EPDM that is used in high grease or oil areas uh, underneath vents. Thermoplastics are TPOs, thermoplastic polyolefin, and PVC, polyvinyl chloride. Those are the two most popular thermoplastic sheets. I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. But first, single ply roofing has been growing in popularity across the United States. Um, and it's been gaining a lot of momentum over the past 15 years. Back in 2001, single ply was about 58% of the total market. And as of the end of 2015, single ply roofing was 83% of the total low slope market, the other being built up roofing and modified bitumen roofing. Some of the reasons for that change are cost, odor, labor, uh, availability. So there are many reasons why single ply roofing has gained in popularity. The usage of products is different based on the climate that you were going to be doing the roof in. So for example in 
to colder climates. EPDM is still very, very popular with 41% of the uh, usage and mostly black EPDM. PVC and TPO, TPO, most popular overall across the entire uh, North American area. On BIP you are at 9.4%. In the warmer climates, a lot of white reflective roofing is specified, and so TPO and PVC are, are very popular. Modbit and BUR are still very popular in the Florida market. Always been popular down there, remains pretty popular in that market. So looking at the national industry membrane mix, TPO is the most popular product, mostly because of cost and availability and capacity. Um, and it is followed by EPDM. Most of that EPDM being black, but there is white EPDM as well. And then Modbit BUR followed by PDC. So choosing the right membrane. Uh, some of the steps that we're going to take for choosing the right membrane are what is the budget of the owner? And most people you know, have a, a budget that the owner is trying to achieve. <clears throat> you're going to look at what ASHRAE climate, uh, climate zone is the building located in. I'll show you the climate zones. There's eight climate zones across the country. And is the building in a high wind zone area? Do we need to beef up the specification to account for being in a high wind zone area? We'll talk about hail and hail resistance. And then we'll ask, is there a lot of foot traffic on the roof? Will the roof be exposed to animal fats, vegetable oils, or petrochemicals? And lastly, are aesthetics important? So, for example, if you have a, a higher office area and you're going to be looking down at a lower roof, we want to make sure that's a, an attractive thing to look down upon. So let's look at EPDM, ethylene polypropylene diene monomer rubber. It's a thermoset material, meaning we will need to use some type of tape or adhesive to adjoin side laps, end laps, and flashing products. One of the great things about EPDM is the fact that it is not a plastic product. And so it performs the absolute best in terms of resistance to UV and ozone. In accelerated weathering tests, EPDM outperforms all other types of single plies in continuous exposure to UV. And not only that, it remains flexible in low and uh, high temperatures. One of the key differences between the thermoset and the thermoplastic EPDM versus the TPO and the PVC is that EPDM is available in non-reinforced and reinforced. Non-reinforced would generally be used in ballasted installation applications and in fully adhered applications. And if you're going to use a mechanically attached installation, you would use a reinforced sheet. So it has a long proven track record. It was introduced to the United States market in 1964. And again, it is available in white or black. This is a look at a fully adhered black EPDM roof. It has solar panels on the top. It also has skylights. And here's a look at the installation of the seam tape. So the tape can either be installed uh, on its own or the tape can in a lot of cases come already on the roll. So if there are, there's tape already on the roll, you simply prime the one side of the sheet. There's a clear release on that adhesive tape, and any contact that will be made with that membrane and the tape must be primed. And then they will roll it in, as you can see, the gentleman on the left-hand side, roll it in, and then peel away the release tape, leaving uh, a quarter to a half inch of that exposed. 
Some of the strengths and weaknesses of EPDM are that it does have the longest track record in the United States, best UV resistance, best hail resistance. One of the applications for EPDM is a ballasted EPDM system. I'll show you an example of that. But it utilizes 10 pounds per square foot of rock to hold the membrane system in place. And obviously hail hitting ballast breaks that hail and uh, protects the membrane. EPDM has good puncture resistance and uh, available black or white. The downside to EPDM would be it is not as resistant to animal fats and vegetable oils and petrochemicals as some of the other types of single plies. If you do have excessive animal fats and vegetable oils around exhaust vents, you do want to treat those areas with epichlorohydrin and grease catchers. If you had extensive animal fat vegetable oil exposure, for example, a turkey processing plant or a dog or cat food plant, you may want to look at a different type of single ply roofing just because of that resistance to those elements there would be greater with some other types of sheets, particularly the PVC sheets. So on the thermoplastic side, you have polyvinyl chloride. Polyvinyl chloride can go into a number of different applications. It can be very rigid, uh, PVC pipe, and it can be rather flexible, like PVC roofing. And so there's a lot of different ways to make PVC. One of the things that gives PVC flexibility and great resistance to UV is the addition of plasticizers. And so one of the uh, the best type of plasticizer enhancement is called ketone ethylene ester, KEE for short. And so that is a plasticizer additive that is used with PVC roof membranes. And it provides a different classification of PVC roof membranes. And then thermoplastic polyolefins are another type of thermoplastic sheet. And we'll tell you a little bit about each of them. When you're looking at thermoplastic products, they will always be reinforced. So there will be a bottom ply, a reinforced scrim, and a top ply. And that reinforced scrim will typically be polyester. There is fiberglass, and fiberglass reinforcement will only be used in fully adhered applications. A close-up view of a machine that is used to heat weld side laps. It has a weighted roller and a nozzle that will slide under the adjoining sheets. You can adjust the temperature setting and the speed of the machine in feet per minute based on ambient temperature. But in general, you'll have hot air fusing together those sheets at roughly a thousand degrees based on the different types of membranes that you're going to be using. So this machine will be used for both a TPO and or a PVC membrane. For the detail work, there are hand welders. And so once these welds are made, the contractor should let the weld cool off for about 30 minutes, and then they will come back with a sharp tool called a probe and they will probe each and every seam to make sure that their seam has uh, no voids in it. So some of the attributes of polyvinyl chloride, it has been in the market in North America since the early 1960s. One of the nice things about it is you can recycle the PVC and the chlorine in the PVC provides excellent fire and chemical resistance. So some of the benefits for PVC are the fact that it does have a long track record. It has a 50-year track record, uh, but really introduced in this North American market in the early 1970s, and uh, excellent chemical resistance. It does have excellent flexibility both in cold temperatures and hot temperatures and excellent fire resistance. 
When we're talking about fire resistance, there are two tests that we reference, the spread of flame and the burning brand. Burning brand, which you see on the bottom, would be fire embers from an external source, say fire in the building next door and embers landing on the rooftop that has PVC. Uh, this PVC membrane does the best of the products we will discuss today in terms of burning brand, and it also performs the best in terms of spread of flame. Spread of flame would be replicating the fire within the structure and flames coming out of a window up over the roof assembly. For the most part, PVC can self-extinguish. So, for example, if a cigarette pot were to be thrown on a PVC roof, it should self-extinguish. One of the myths of PVC is that uh, it gives off chlorine gas, and that that is a myth. So, what is given off is hydrogen chloride, and hydrogen chloride is classified as an irritant, and as an irritant, it has a pungent odor. You can smell the chlorine in that hydrogen chloride. So it is not any, any more dangerous than any other type of building material, but more importantly, a lot of other building materials give off carbon monoxide, which is an odorless gas. So when you do have exposure to uh, burning PVC, uh, you are well aware of it. And uh, with the others, you may have a uh, exposure to a gas that you do not know you're exposed to. Some of the benefits of PVC are that you use heat welded seams. Key difference between the, the heat welded seams and a PVC versus a TPO are that you have a little bit of bleed out on the weld. And the advantage of the bleed out of the weld is that you see that you have a solid weld there. So that's a key difference between PVC and TPO. You do have more smoking of the weld when you're heat welding with PVC versus TPO, uh, and a little bit less with the KEE than the standard PVC. And I'll show you a picture of that. So there are different types of reinforcements available with PVC. The great majority of it will be polyester reinforced. And you also have what's called fleece back, which I will discuss. It has a polyester uh, reinforcement on the back side. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. But that can be reinforced with polyester and or fiberglass. The ASTM standard for PVC is ASTM D4434. And the ASTM standard for KEE is D6754. In these ASTMs, there is a polymer content portion of the ASTM, and then there is a physical property characteristic of the ASTM, which is the minimum thickness and the minimum thickness over scrim. So thickness over scrim is something to take close consideration of because the bulk of your weather, weathering package or weather resistance and expense in a membrane is in the top surface over the scrim. So one of the things you want to look at is thickness over scrim is important and overall thickness is important. And typically thicker is better. So a little bit about the KEE. Ketone ethylene ester developed by DuPont in 1973, and it is an, a solid, high molecular weight plasticizer additive. And so it will be an enhancement to a standard uh, plasticizer that is used with PVC. Some of the old, old versions of PVC were very, very thin and the plasticizers that were used were not very good, and the early, early versions of PVC were typically unreinforced. So they were thin, unreinforced, with not so good plasticizers. And what happened was, after exposure to UV, the plasticizer would actually leave the sheet, and the product would become brittle over time. 
and to the point where with some thin, thin sheets, you could actually have some cracking of the membrane while it's up on the roof. So the lesson learned is reinforced membrane, thicker membrane, and enhanced plasticizers. And this would be the premium, premium plasticizer additive. Now, it does come with a higher cost, so of all the products we will discuss today, the PVC with KEE is the most expensive product on the market. But what it does is it has an excellent weather resistance package, uh, great UV protection, great flexibility, and because of that weathering package, it will stay cleaner than a standard PVC sheet. But most importantly, <clears throat> it would have the best resistance of all the single ply systems to exposure to diesel fuel, jet fuel, you know, peanut oil, and animal fats. So if you do know that you're going to have exposure to those types of conditions, this is a product you may want to consider. Plenty of accessories are available for use with all of the single ply systems. Uh, anywhere from split pipe seals to square tube wraps, inside outside corners, walkways, etc. I mentioned reduced smoke, so the, on the left hand side you can see standard PVC smoking a, a little bit and, and very little with the KEE. As with uh, KEE, there's very little smoke generated with heat rolling of TPO. One other installation is uh, a PVC rib, and you would use this in conjunction with a fleece back PVC. It can also be available in TPO. This will replicate the look of a standing seam metal roof. And you actually heat weld the ribs to that fleece back system. You can space out the ribs according to uh, the architectural look that you're trying to achieve. So quick recap of PVC and KEE. Longest track record of the thermoplastic sheets. Best resistance to the animal fats, vegetable oils, and petrochemicals. Good reflectivity. It is a white sheet, also available in tan and gray. Not as good a reflectivity as TPO. Um, not as resistant to hail as EPDM. And good puncture resistance but the EPDM and the TPO have better puncture resistance. And there's varying forms of puncture resistance and tear strength with the various types of uh, type 3 or type 4 PVCs. Number of plastic polyolefins uh, do not require any plasticizers, so that's a key difference. And the polymer contains no chlorine. Um, and it has been on the market since the early 1990s. TPO very white and reflective. You can achieve uh, lead uh, solar reflectance index with white or tan TPO. If you're going to look down on a lower roof, you may want to consider the tan uh, just because white roofs are very, very reflective and can be very, very bright. So on those walk pads, for example, they are, they are uh, colored on the side with a yellow uh, warning line for safety. TPO here being used also in a fully adhered application under solar panels. TPO can be mechanically attached or fully adhered. Of all the sheets, it's the most economical sheet. It would come in 45, 60, and 80 mil. There's also self-adhered products available that have the bonding adhesive already on the bottom side of the TPO sheet. There's also clean sheets available that have a release, uh, a removable release film on the top side of the TPO that you can use to assure yourselves uh, a clean installation. TPOs have good resistance to animal fats, vegetable oils, and petrochemicals. They just aren't as good as the PVCs and the KEEs, but very, very good performance. Of all the products, they have the best reflectivity, good puncture resistance, and as mentioned, available in white, gray, or tan. The white and the tan would meet the SRI uh, 
uh, for a lead, solar reflective index. Fleeceback membranes. Fleeceback membranes have a polyester fleece attached to the bottom side of the membrane. And this is available in all of the types of single ply systems, EPDM white or black, PVC or TPO. I'll tell you a little bit about some of the attributes of that polyester fleece in terms of enhanced puncture and tear resistance and uplift resistance. So puncture, hail, and uplift are some of the reasons why you would consider a fleece back system. But also if you're doing an addition to an existing facility and do want do not want to have a lot of disturbance during this construction process. You can eliminate the need for screws and plates for both insulation and coverboard attachment and then you can attach the membrane with a urethane adhesive as well. So it can be a very quiet installation while also providing excellent, excellent uplift resistance, hail resistance, and puncture resistance. So one of the nice things about the fleeceback systems are that it is a low or no VOC adhesive option. So you have options on the adhesives that are used. The fleeceback systems will have the best hail damage resistance outside of a ballasted product. And it does enhance that puncture resistance by 40% over a standard non-fleeced product. So as mentioned, it's available in all the different types. And when we think about hail, we typically think of Texas, Oklahoma, as the big areas for hailstorms, and, and they are. They certainly get hit the most. But as you look at this map closely, you'll see that there is a hail zone that goes right up where Interstate 85 is. Uh, all the way from Georgia up through the Triad and Triangle area and then Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, Columbia, South Carolina had a fairly significant hailstorm last spring. Dallas, you may have heard earlier this year, had three inch hail. So they got hit very, very hard <clears throat> about a month and a half ago. Some of the attributes of the urethane adhesive, it's a two-part urethane, is the fact that metal screws and plates for attachment of insulation are thermally conductive. And so when using a urethane adhesive in lieu of screws and plates, you can add a little bit of R value, just, just a little bit. But more importantly, you're not taking any R value away through the thermal conductivity of those screws and plates. So if you're using a two-part urethane adhesive, there are no VOCs, and there is really very, very little noise or disturbance. Example of an area where disturbance might be uh, important is any business that's open 24 hours a day. Or if you had an old exposed wood deck and you didn't want to penetrate with screws and plates due to the debris that it would create on the interior. Urethane adhesive for installation would be a great choice. The urethane adhesive can be installed by the contractor in a couple of different ways. One is a dual cartridge, two cartridge caulking, and you'll see that the adhesive comes out in a liquid form. It will very quickly rise in about a minute, and then you will place that fleece back membrane into that adhesive and then you'll roll it in with a 150 pound weighted roller. There's also equipment that can full spray the adhesive, very fast economical installation. If you're going to apply it in ribbons there are very specific ribbon patterns for field perimeter and corner attachment of insulation cover boards as well as the membrane. Here they put down the insulation, they put down the uh, gypsum cover board, and 
Now they're putting down the ribbons for the attachment of the fleece back membrane. So the components of the roof assembly, the roof deck, insulation, cover board, membrane, and edge metal. As we look at the various installation techniques, the first one being loose laid ballasted, primarily this is an EPDM system. There are millions upon millions of square feet installed throughout the Carolinas of loose laid ballasted EPDM. Simply loose laying the insulation, loose laying the membrane, you'll use the widest sheet possible. There are widths all the way up to 50 feet. And then you'll secure that with 10 pounds per square foot of ballast. And so big market now is for ballast ships, meaning move the rock, replace the membrane, add insulation where needed, uh, new membrane, and reuse the rock. So there's a lot of that going on throughout the Carolinas. Mechanically attached applications are typically uh, four by eight insulation, uh, six fasteners, uh, four or six fasteners depending on the length of the warranty. Secure the insulation and then secure the membrane, the fastening and the seam at either six inches or 12 inches on center. Kind of a hybrid system is called an induction welded system where on the top of the insulation fastening plate you'll have a coating of either PVC or TPO. And you can induction weld with this machine. You'll lay out the plates for the insulation and then you'll induction weld and then you'll put uh, magnets over those plates to cool. And secures the bottom side of the membrane to the top of that insulation securement plate. And so in this picture you'll see the, the touch points are greatly enhanced on the left hand side with the induction welding versus the standard mechanically attached, which can cut down on the billowing of the membrane. For adhered applications, each of these different types of single plies can be fully adhered. There is solvent-based bond adhesive, low VOC bond adhesive, water-based bond adhesive, and in some cases, self-adhered membranes. So there's a lot of different options when it comes to adhered membranes. And of course, fleece back. Fleece back is typically fully adhered. However, it can be mechanically attached, uh, but typically it will be used with a, a two-part urethane adhesive attachment. Talking about warranties, warranties can go anywhere from five years in length up to 30 years in length. It depends on the mill thickness of membrane and the cost and the budget of the owner. But some of the options that you can include in to a warranty are skylights, garden roofs, and uh, you know, pedestals and pavers and overburden removal. You can also have hail impact resistance in a warranty as well as puncture resistance. So it all depends on the type of system and what warranty options are available. The typical wind speed warranty uh, for most system manufacturers is 55 miles per hour. For mechanically attached applications, you can get up to a 90 mile per hour wind speed warranty, and you can get up to a 120 mile per hour wind speed warranty with a fully adhered system. Now, when we talk about a 120 mile per hour wind event, keep in mind that's a three second peak gust wind speed. But if we were in a 120 mile per hour wind event today, we would be very, very frightened because that's a very, very significant wind event. Most of the damage to low slope roofing during a wind event such as that comes from exterior debris causing damage over the top of the membrane versus the membrane completely uh, becoming removed from the structure. So let's talk about energy efficiency. So the codes uh, are driven by what's called ASHRAE 90.1. Uh, which is debated and uh, discussed uh, by the members of ASHRAE, and it is published every three years. 
The International Energy Conservation Code takes ASHRAE 90.1 and writes it into a code format that a state or, or area can use as its own energy code. And it is updated as well every three years. Within ASHRAE 90.1, there are eight climate zones. Very colorful map. So you need to know what climate zone the structure you're designing is going to be located in because that will determine the energy code requirements for that project. So for example, in the Carolinas, we have three energy codes, uh, climate zones three, four, and five. North Carolina has its own energy code, the 2012 North Carolina Energy Conservation Code, and it follows the 2009 version of the International Energy Conservation Code, but North Carolina uh, increased the R value requirements on average by about 20% for insulation above deck. It's a very progressive energy code, however there are some caveats to the North Carolina Energy Conservation Code for alterations and for additions. For alterations and additions, there's also a House Bill 201 that states that you can refer back to the 2009 North Carolina Energy Conservation Code if it's a non-Group R project and does not increase the size of the structure by more than 150 percent. So in Chapter 3 of the North Carolina Energy Conservation Code, you'll have the climate zones identified by county. And then in Chapter 5, you'll see a table 502.21. It'll provide the R value requirements for insulation entirely above deck. And you'll see in climate zones 3, <coughs> in climate zone 3, it's R25, which Charlotte is in climate zone 3. Climate zones 4 and 5 are R30. South Carolina follows the 2009 International Energy Conservation Code as it is written. And so where Charlotte is in climate zone 3, if we went over the border to Rock Hill, South Carolina, we would only have an R-value requirement of R20 versus R25 in Mecklenburg County, Charlotte, North Carolina. For insulation purposes, polyiso has probably an 80 5% share of the overall market for low slope roof insulation. And the ASTM is ASTM C1289-06 type 2. There's class 1 and class 2 in two different grades, grade 2 and grade 3 for 20 PSI or 25 PSI. Class 2 would have a coated glass facer on it, which would be moisture resistant and mold resistant versus class one, which is a fiberglass reinforced organic facer. When you add up the R value requirements in new construction to be R20, 25, or 30, that foam plastic insulation will be the highest cost item in the roofing assembly. So we want to protect that investment in that foam plastic insulation with a cover board. And a cover board can come in a version of a higher compressive strength polyiso product, or it can come in a glass mat gypsum product, which is very, very popular. What happens to a very fragile, uh, low compressive strength foam plastic is that you, if you do not protect it, you can have damage, uh, warping, and crushing. And so with 20 or 25 PSI, uh, for the foam plastic insulation, a cover board would, would, would provide a compressive strength of 100 up to 1,000, depending on the type of product that you choose. So it's highly recommended by both the National Roofing Contractors Association and most membrane manufacturers to use a cover board where you can. Let's talk about thermal bridging for a minute. We talked about the attribute of a low uh, rise foam adhesive for insulation attachment. When we talk about mechanical screws and plates, uh, what you can see in the picture on the right is that you can have an awful lot of thermal transfer at joints around insulation and at the fasteners. You 
because the metal is very thermally conductive. So simply using a urethane adhesive for insulation attachment or for secondary layers of insulation attachment can provide a lot of thermal efficiency. It will be more expensive to use urethane adhesive versus screws and plates, but you will, the owner will save money over time due to the thermal conductivity of screws and plates. Here the insulation board has been put down and now they're going to put the cover board down and the urethane adhesive, the ribbons. And the other thing we want to consider during construction is air infiltration, which can move <coughs> construction generated moisture into a roofing assembly. So we want to seal air leakage points and eliminate the vapor drive into the roofing assembly. And that moisture can accumulate due to operational generated moisture or construction generated moisture. What can happen is uh, moisture entering the roofing assembly can cause bowing and warping of and damage to insulation uh, facers. And particularly on white membranes in cooler climates, that moisture can hit its dew point and condensate on the underside of that white membrane. So it can create some serious issues. Simple gaps in construction can move an awful lot of uh, moist air. Four inch gap is moving air at 5.3 miles per hour. And so we want to seal angle changes and around penetrations and a strong consideration, depending on the climate zone, for an air barrier uh, and vapor retarder on a roof deck. And so in this particular detail, with a metal deck, there is a rising foam that you can use to fill in the flutes, and then you want to seal around those angle changes up to the height of the insulation, <coughs> and then we will flash to the regular open wall. We also want to seal around any penetrations with the foam and the pressure-sensitive flashing material. You can use uh, these types of products on both metal decks and monolithic types of decks. If it's a metal deck, there is a, an air barrier that can be used directly on a metal roof deck for use with mechanically attached insulation. And so takeaways would be we want to seal off uh, moisture flowing into the roofing assembly from various sources around all angle changes and penetrations, whether it is concrete deck or a metal deck. And specify an air, air and vapor retarder where necessary. Metal edging, we talked about uplift pressures. Uplift pressures are greatest at the corner, followed by the perimeter. 60% of litigation claims originate from the roof area in a building, and 60% of those are from metal edge failures. And the metal edge is typically only 10% of the total cost of the roof, or 1% of the total cost of the building. So very minor area cost-wise can create a lot of problems cost-wise in construction. And what happens is improperly pleated metal, when wind hits the face of the building, can force failure modes at edge metal. And there is a positive and negative pressure that will work to create a lift at that improperly pleated metal and your uplift pressure is the greatest in those areas, so it becomes very vulnerable. So the code specifically addresses edge metal in Chapter 15, Section 1504.5, and they say that low-sloped membrane roof system metal edge securement must be tested for resistance in accordance with ANSI SPRI ES1, very specific tests for fascia and coping. Most all roofing manufacturers will have manufactured metal that has been tested 
for ANSI SPRI ES1. And not only that, you can include it with most any major roofing manufacturer into a total systems warranty. And I would just include it in the warranty section in terms of length of years, wind speed, call out specifically length of service, wind speed, and if you want to include edge metal. So some of the extruded uh, fascia is an extruded aluminum cleat and a uh, snap-on. Some of the references we used for today's presentation were the International Code Conference, www.iccsafe.org. PIMA is the Polyiso Insulation Manufacturing Organization. There's great information on tapered polyiso, tapered design, proper storage of materials, and uh, fire performance characteristics of polyiso. SPRY, single ply roofing institute, spry.org, a WD1 document that I referenced is available for download, which gives you the tables. And then energycodes.gov is uh, a site that you can uh, gather information on the energy codes of any of the states. Thank you for participating today. Uh, I would like to run down uh, specifically any questions that are typed in. If you have a question you want to type in, I will be glad to answer it. <clears throat> also, I'd like to just briefly tell you a little bit about Carlisle. Uh, Carlisle has two EPDM plants, three TPO plants, seven polyiso plants, and eight lines. <clears throat> they also make their own adhesives. They make expanded polystyrene, waterproofing and air barrier products, and PVC. And in 2015, Carlisle had sales in excess of 3.5 billion. Some of the brand names associated with Carlisle are SureCO EPDM, SureWell TPO, SureFlex PVC, and FleeceVac associated with any of those products. I mentioned a clean sheet, very new product called APL. TPO with APL is available in 60 mil. There's a removable film surface that's gray in color over a white membrane. And it can be left exposed for 120 days. And so you remove that after all trades are finished with their work. And voila, very clean and reflective roof. It's called APL, protective film. And then lastly, uh, Carlisle also makes underlayments for their standing seat metal called uh, WIP, Water and Ice Protection, 300 HT, high temperature exposure of 120 days. I will look to see if there are any questions. <clears throat> and uh, you do have Ted's email address, ted at premier BLDG products. Again, please uh, send him your full name, your company name, and your AIA number. And if you're not an AIA member and you just want a certificate of completion, please feel free to email Ted and uh, we will send you a certificate of completion. I thank you for your attention this afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Jones. If you have a question for me, I'm at Greg, G-R-E-G, -E at premierbldgproducts.com. Feel free to send a question to me or to Ted, and we'll get an answer as quickly as possible. Appreciate you attending. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much.